these noble messengers and including the last of them all, the Blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As we greet you, yes, with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Our topic is an interesting one, more than that. It's an exciting one. Exciting for those who recognize that absolute truth is located in the Quran, not with the British government, not with the newspapers and television. Absolute truth is located in the Quran. <coughs> Exciting for those who want to go to the Quran to locate what the Quran has to say about the world today. Who does that today? Do you know of anyone who goes to the Quran? to locate what the Qur'an has to offer, which explains the world today. Nobody does that today. And yet, the Qur'an declares in Surah Al-Nahl that Allah has sent this book to explain all things. And therefore, to explain the world, <laughs> the mysterious world today and the world which is yet to come. So good news and glad tidings for those in whose heart there is this thirst for knowledge and who in his, whose heart there is this love for the Book of Allah. Whether you be a brother or a sister, it makes no difference. And you spend <laughs> your whole life devoted to the Book of Allah. That the Book of Allah <laughs> and He who was sent to teach the Quran, namely Prophet Muhammad, the Book of Allah might teach you and explain to you the world in which we live today. I have been blessed by Allah to do this work for all my life. And I'm able to do it not only because of His kindness to me, but also because Allah blessed me with a great teacher who taught me how to study the Quran. And uh, we begin, <coughs> uh, excuse the cough, it was heavy me all through Ramadan, it's still there now, the cough. <coughs> Our Prophet Allah's blessings be upon him spoke about Dajjal, that the Christians referred to as the Antichrist. And he called him al masih dajjal Dajjal, who will claim to be the Messiah. al masih dajjal But the Qur'an tells us that the Messiah is Jesus, the son of the Virgin Mary. He is the Messiah. So if this one claims to be the Messiah, obviously, it is a false claim, and he is an imposter. So, al masih dajjal is Dajjal, the false messiah. Having explained that term, since it is his mission to impersonate the true messiah, what would he have to do? Uh, 
this will be the best introduction of all. I wrote it more than 20 years ago. Jerusalem in the Quran is the best introduction you'll have for this subject. But uh, <coughs> I did write this book as well, my first book on Dajjal. Dajjal, the Quran, and Awwalu Zaman. Dajjal, the Quran, and the beginning of history. And thank Allah, thank Allah, thank Allah, I was able to write this book, which is our subject of our lecture today. The Jal, the Jasad, and the Batul Al. So, if he has to impersonate the Messiah, and to deceive the Jews, into believing that he is the true Messiah, rather than Jesus, the son of Mary, the Virgin Mary. Allah's blessing be upon him both. Then what would he have to do? I cannot in this lecture take you back to the crucifixion. I, I, we don't have the time to do that. It's just sufficient that they rejected him as the Messiah. Jesus, the son of Mary, they rejected him. And when they saw him, Crucified, Allah made it appear to them like that. They believe that he could not have been a Messiah, he is dead. And so they are still waiting for the Messiah. This is crucial information for you to be able to understand this subject. My students know the subject very well. <laughs> but those who are new and green, you got to Think, be careful. You gotta first clean the mind. <laughs> he wants to impersonate the Messiah and deceive them into believing that he is indeed the true Messiah because they have rejected the true Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary. Now then, our prophet said Allah's blessing be upon him about the true Messiah that he would rule the world with justice. Hakamun adlun or imamun muqsitun. A ruler who will be just. Ruling what? Potsmat? <laughs> no. Ruling the world in the sense as having no rival to him. None who can threaten his rule over the world. And this is precisely the kind of rule that Solomon had. Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam. It is in this sense of the word that Solomon ruled the world. Because there was no one on the earth who could rival his rule or threaten his rule. All had to submit to him. Today this is called Pax Suleimania. When you are a ruling state in the world and none can defy you, none can threaten you, none can rival you, then you are Pax Britannica or Pax Americana. So, so this is what the Messiah will do. He will eventually rule the world. And he's coming back. This is not the topic for tonight. If the Messiah is to rule the world, he will have to do so from Jerusalem. He will have to establish a holy state of Israel in Jerusalem. That holy state of Israel must become a ruling state in the world. And then the Messiah can rule the world from Jerusalem. This is the easy part of the lecture. Now then, if the false Messiah is to successfully impersonate the true Messiah, obviously he will have to first of all 
liberate the Holy Land, which is under Muslim rule. Has he already done that? Has he already done that? Yes. I know many people eat their biryani and go home and sleep. <laughs> but there are others who are not sleeping. Yes, he's already done that. Liberate the Holy Land for the Jews. Number two, he'll have to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. Has he done that? Yes. Number three, he'll have to restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land. Has he done that? Yes, he has. Number four, he has to cause that state of Israel to become the ruling state in the world. Is that about to occur? So now when, when Israel becomes the ruling state in the world and after Pax Britannica has been replaced by Pax Americana and Pax Americana has been replaced by Pax Judaica only then would the Jal, the false Messiah, be able to stand up in Jerusalem and declare, I am the Messiah. Can you believe it? That this simple explanation, and I remain a solitary voice in the entire world of Islamic scholarship, for long is what? I'm the only voice saying this. Nobody is prepared to come forward and say exactly what I've just said. When this is so plain, so I don't know what's wrong. Is it fair? Is it a lack of capacity to understand? Is it because they are imprisoned in a scholarship that cannot accept this? What it is, I don't know. But I still remain one solitary voice. Ever since I wrote Jerusalem in the Quran 20 something years ago to explain this subject, I still remain a solitary voice explaining what I have just explained to you. May Allah open the way for my students tomorrow, maybe one from Portsmouth, who will dazzle the world as a scholar of Islam. Amin. Now then, having established the Dajjal wants to rule the world from the holy state of Israel, from Jerusalem, in order to deceive the Jews and to declare that he is the Messiah. Let us now turn to the Quran and to Surah to Saad. I will not give you the number of the ayah, that's your homework. I just give you the name of the surah. And <coughs> Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam is the ruler of the world. The holy state of Israel based from Jerusalem is the ruling state in the world. No one can rival it, not even the queen of Sheba. All must submit to him. And then one day, Allah gave him what I recognize to be a vision. And he sees something with the internal eye. What does he see? You and I will immediately understand what happened because of the introduction I've already given you. But the world of Islamic scholarship, all those who have written the tafsir of the Quran, every single tafsir you can find, still will not recognize what this verse, what this passage of the Quran is saying. But you will easily understand it. This is our predicament today. 
بعلوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولقد فتن سليمان الله says and we tested him we gave to him something which caused some distress to him what was it wa alqayna ala kursihi jasad and we placed a jasad on his throne he is the king he is the prophet he is he who sits on the throne but allah puts someone else to sit on the throne and that other person allah describes him as a jasad so who or what is a jasad let the quran answer that question the quran tells us that when moses nabi musa alayhisalam when he went up to the mountain mount sinai allah called him there he left the banu israel in sinai and one of them known as the samiri told them give me your gold and he had a degree in engineering metallurgy so he <laughs> melted he melted the gold and he forged a golden cap this man had a phd in engineering <laughs> and he, he forged the golden cap so skillfully that when the wind <laughs> when the wind blew the calf would go moo la hu khawar and allah described that golden calf as a jasad a body without a soul and now the same word is used for someone sitting on the throne this can't be a calf this has to be a human being only a human being would sit on a throne <laughs> so this is a human being but he does not have the soul that human beings have that's why he is described as a jasad when suleiman alayhi salam saw him sitting on the throne in a vision he immediately understood what was the meaning he was able to interpret the vision we would take years to interpret the vision <laughs> yes some of us never but he suleiman in a twinkling of an eye is able to understand the vision and we are able to recognize his understanding his interpretation of the vision in the response that he made this is proper methodology for study what was his response he turned towards allah for ana and then he said to allah rabb qul rabbig firli he wants to ask something from allah and his method is if he wants to ask for something he first asks for forgiveness setting an example for us when we want to ask for something first ask for forgiveness for sin that we have committed all of us have committed sins so call a rabbig firli he said oh allah kindly forgive me he's not speaking about any particular sin that he committed no he's speaking generally to forgive me my sins wa hab li mulkan la yanbaghi li ahadin min ba'di and grant that none can inherit my kingdom after me you notice how slowly i'm speaking <laughs> so it will sink in he recognized that that fella on the throne wants to inherit my kingdom he recognized him as an evil being 
And he does not want that evil being to ever rec inherit his kingdom. Who could that evil being be? Who wants to inherit his kingdom? And he is so opposed to it. But he begs Allah that none should ever inherit my kingdom. Meaning, when I die, I want my kingdom to be finished. So none can inherit it. You and I would easily recognize that that jasad is Dajjal. So then why is it? <laughs> why we can recognize so easily that jasad is Dajjal? How come that the world of Islamic scholarship. There's no one else who does that. Mine is still a solitary voice and they're not willing to accept my views when it is so plain and clear. If he wants to inherit my kingdom and he is an evil being, Allah created an evil being, Kul, A'uzu bi rabbil falak. What comes after? Min sharri ma khalaq. I seek refuge with Allah from evil which He has created. What is the evil that Allah has created? Only Dajjal. That's the only evil being He has created. So. <coughs> <coughs> he does not want that evil being to inherit the kingdom. So he makes this dua, grant me a kingdom which none can inherit after me. But it also has a second meaning, that grant that there will never be another kingdom that will ever be comparable to mine. Two meanings. From this passage of the Qur'an, we know this is the first reference in the Qur'an to Dajjal. First reference. There are others as well. But Dajjal is never mentioned by name. You have to have insight. You have to be able to interpret ayat mutashabihat verses of the Qur'an which must be interpreted to be able to recognize the verses in the Qur'an which pertain to Dajjal. But Allah not only answered the dua and caused the kingdom to collapse as soon as he died, but Allah did something else. He answered this dua by making this kingdom incomparable by putting something strange. In addition to human beings and angels, Allah has also created the jinn. And amongst the jinn, there are those who are Muslims, they are believers, and there are others who are called Shayateen. There are lots of them in Washington. So, <laughs> Allah gave orders to the Shayateen to work for Suleiman. And if they ever disobey him, Allah punishes them with terrible punishment. And the shayateen are involved in kulla banna in Mogawas, building skyscrapers, tall buildings, huge things, and also going down into the depths of the earth. And when you go down into the depths of the earth, you can discover the diamond veins. You can discover gold. And more important than that, you can discover oil. Oh. 
Are you putting on your thinking caps now? These shayateen, Allah says, up and down. Up and down. So you're going to see, you're going to see in the future, whoever has control over the shayateen will be able to do wondrous things up above and below. Okay? And some of the shayateen are also in chains. And they're working for Suleiman. Now we leave Surah to Saad and the vision and the divine response and we go to Surah to Saba and it's time for Solomon to die. And once he dies, this dua is going to come into effect. And in Surah to Saba, Allah says, Walamma qadha Suleiman al maut When that time came for Solomon to die, the jinn did not know that he was dead. And they saw someone sitting on his throne. And whoever was sitting on his throne was impersonating Solomon. He was holding the staff of Solomon. And the staff of these two prophets were miraculous, the Prophet Moses, Musa Islam. Do you remember? He threw the staff on the ground and it became, remember? Became a serpent, a snake. Yeah, you remember? And uh, this, uh, and he, he took his staff and he struck the rock and 12 streams of water came out. Do you remember? Shake your heads. <laughs> so this is not an ordinary staff. This staff has something inside of it. Mine has only wood. <laughs> That's all, only wood. I can throw it on the ground. It won't turn into a serpent, a snake. But this staff, of Suleiman alayhi salam. Like the staff of Moses, Musa alayhi salam, has inside of it a miraculous capacity. And whoever is holding on to the staff is able to deceive the jinn by providing evidence that Solomon is still alive. Look at him, he's walking, he's talking, he's eating, he's sitting, he's standing. How can someone holding the staff do that? That inner capacity of the staff is described in Surah to Sabah as the minsa of the staff. When I was researching this subject a couple of years ago, I taught minsa. What is this? Because the staff is a saw and that is with sword. And minsa is with seen. So I consulted some of the best experts in Quranic um, semantics and the Quran of the Quran, uh, the 
the Arabic of the Quran, people who had done their PhDs. And the answer that I got from them was that min sa'a is the same thing as asa. That min sa'a is just the stuff. And these are the best experts in the Arabic language and the Arabic of the Quran. But I was not happy with that. And so I forged ahead all on my own. And I eventually was led by Allah to understand that no, Minsa is not the stuff. Minsa is the property of the stuff, the capacity of the stuff. That if you are holding on to this stuff of Suleiman, alayhi salam, you can enter into time and you can move forward and backward in time. Because Minsa comes from Nasi. In Naman Nasium Ziat, that on Lil Kufris is Sura to Toba. The system of time. And that was a great discovery. And so now, it was Dajjal they saw sitting on the throne. And because he was holding on to this stuff, he was able to bring movement of time backward and forward and show Suleiman still alive. Today, commonplace on television, uh, General Charles de Gaulle is dead indeed. But go on television, you see him. <laughs> huh? uh, Ronald Reagan is dead indeed. Go on television, you see him walking and talking. Today is commonplace. But at that time, the jinn were deceived. And they will continue to be deceived. They will continue to be deceived, says Surah to Saba, until when? While the jar is sitting on that throne and he has control over the shayateen, he can order them to do everything he wants to do, cryptocurrency and all. And they will continue to obey him. Are you beginning to understand now the power of the modern West? This is what you're dealing with. And that has not as yet stopped. Because he's still sitting on the throne. Remember, this is the vision, eh? This is the vision. He's still sitting on the throne. The jinn are still seeing him there. He's still giving them orders. And they are under an obligation to obey. And if they disobey, Allah will punish them. So they all are weighing. But the Quran goes on to say that among the signs of, of the last stage of Akhir Zaman is not only the Jal, not only Gog and Magog, but also Dabbatul Art, the beast or the creature of the earth. Christian eschatology has it. And we also have it. Dabbatul Ard. And Dabbatul Ard is, <coughs> is mentioned twice in the Quran. The first mention of Dabbatul Ard is that they would harm mankind. They would cause injury to mankind. Taklimuhum. And then the second reference to Darbatul Ard in the Quran is here in Surah Al Sabah. That it is when Darbatul Ard comes, they are released and they start to attack the staff in order to consume the minsa of the stuff. Only then 
with the staff lose its miraculous power. And Dajjal will no longer have the shayateen working for him because now they would see Solomon is dead so we can disobey him. <laughs> Allah will not punish us. When that happens, goodbye to the state of Israel. So then, who are the Batul Arb? Who will consume the minsa of the step? I am full of sadness in my heart to have to disclose to you. It, it will pain you really when you read what are located in the books of Tafsir. Some of the most eminent of the scholars of Tafsir, including in the modern age, they say, Excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> I should not be laughing. <laughs> they say the Dalbatul are the termites. And when Solomon died, no one knew he was dead. And the body was sitting on the throne, kept on sitting on the throne for I don't know how many years. No one knew he was dead. Until these termites came and started <laughs> nibbling at the bottom of the staff. And when the staff lost its balance, the staff collapsed and then the body collapsed. And only then did the world know that Solomon was dead. Go check it out. Go and check it out. You will find that this is what is to be found. This is the explanation that prevails in the world of Islamic scholarship. And when I offer this other explanation, which is truth, they resist me. I will be dead and still they will not accept it. What can you do? What can you do with such people other than what I am doing? I am teaching while still I have life and planting the seeds for a new generation of scholars of Islam who will emerge, who will have the courage to extend the fringes of knowledge. And so Dalbatul Ard has to be something which can damage and destroy the miraculous inner capacity of the staff. The miraculous inner power of the staff. What can it be that will destroy it? There are many young people who rush forward to say, no, it's 5G and 6G. The uh, electromagnetic uh, wave that comes from the uh, wireless internet. I don't even know the technical terminology. But the rush hour to say, yeah, this is it. And then when I examine that thesis, I find to my surprise. Our Prophet said al Islam, that birds flying in the sky, small birds will fall down. Small birds will fall down because they can no longer navigate, because there is a contamination of the atmosphere. When bees can no longer navigate to go to the flowers for honey, and honey production is falling. You know you're dealing with this subject. But something else. The, the most important capacity that a human being has 
is his capacity to think. Is there anyone who will differ with that? And what is happening now is that our capacity to think is declining. One of the most important components of the process of thinking is memory. And if you look at the children today, a child at the age of eight and nine and 10 and 11 has the most powerful memory. That child can memorize the whole Quran at that age. You try to do the memorization of the Quran at age 40, see what's gonna happen. But if you try to memorize the Quran at seven and eight and nine and 10 and 11, you can do it because the memory of the child is so powerful. Guess what's happening in the world today for people who think? I'm not talking about those who eat the biryani and go home and sleep. I'm talking about people who think. The answer is children growing up in the cities are now suffering a decline in their memory. And so tomorrow you will never have any hafiz of the Qur'an from a child growing in the city. The hafiz of the Qur'an will be a child growing up in the village. Hmm? So there is evidence to support the view of those who rush to say, Sheikh, 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 it's 5G and 6G. I say, yes, you are correct. That the Dabbatul Al that the Qur'an is speaking about is the electromagnetic waves with which we are now being inundated in the world, which is causing havoc, not only to be to honey production, havoc not only to children whose memory is declining, but who knows what else is doing. And this is also destroying the minsa of the stuff. I have taken you on an interesting journey today. I'm not boasting, because when you boast, Allah takes away your knowledge. But today I am unfortunately the only voice in the world of Islam which is explaining the subject this way. And my prayer is that Allah may send tomorrow scholars who will dazzle the world. In the meantime, here is this book, the Quran, the Jal, and the Jasad, which includes the Dabbatul And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might bless you to penetrate absolute truth in the Quran, so that the Quran might explain to you the world today. I want to stop now because I know the question and answer session is going to be exciting. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Jazakallah, Sheikh. Very much appreciate the lecture. And so I think we'll give it a few minutes before the question and answer just for everyone to think about any questions they may have, they may have for the Sheikh. Okay, so I think for the question answer, if anyone has, uh, has a question for the chef, if you could just raise your hand and then you can go ahead and ask it. My hearing is declining. So when you ask the question and he'll have to tell me what's the question. Go ahead. Yeah. Yep.
Yeah. Okay. So the question is, Sheikh, is the modern age where we're currently living in using the shayateen al to create tall skyscrapers and building and technology? It, it is the shayateen who are assisting modern Western civilization with the continuing scientific and technological revolution, which is going up and going down. This is knowledge that Allah has given, because He says in the Quran, "Was sakhara lakum." Allah has subjected to human beings, to the use of human beings, everything in the heavens and the earth. And they have the knowledge and they exploit it, so they gave us oil. Uh, maybe in another lecture you'll hear me speaking on the subject of Dajjal and oil, not today. And yes, we are entitled to that knowledge because it's the property of all of mankind. So that does not mean that technology is something haram. What is haram is the use of the technology. If you use the technology, like I use a laptop, and I've written, mashallah, about 31, 31 books, and I'm now working on number 32. If I didn't have the laptop, I would not be able to do so much work. So I am using technology, but I'm not using it in a haram way. But cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, huh? That also is technology at work in the world of money. But you'll never find me buying cryptocurrency and buying Bitcoin. You'll never find me doing that. Not at all. And if I had support from the world of scholars of Islam, we would have been able to build our markets with gold and silver coin, dinar and dirham. And we would not be using this paper money, which is a rope around our neck. They've used the paper money to bring down Imran Khan in Pakistan with inflation. It's the deadliest weapon of all because they can change the value of money. It's a very simple thing to study. So when we find something in the world of science and technology from which we can benefit, we should benefit from it. Jazakallah, Sheikh. So, any next questions? Yep. So, it's the question what are the fears of the Shayateen and where are they? So the question is, Sheikh, are modern day shayateens aware they are uh, shayateen? And if they are aware, um, like why are they doing what they are doing, is the question. <laughs> yes. <coughs> the modern day shayateen are to be found everywhere. But <laughs> they they don't know that they are shayateen. <laughs> they just brought down Imran Khan's government in Pakistan. <laughs> yes, but they don't know. Okay? <laughs> they believe the chief of staff of the Pakistan Armed Forces believes he is rightly guided. He doesn't even have a passing acquaintance with the Quran. They don't teach that in the military academies, but no one is allowed to defer with him. Dandai. No one is allowed to 
uh, question him. You have to accept whatever the armed forces say, submit to us. <laughs> you see, this is the profile of the shayateen around the world today. You also have shayateen amongst women. Our prophet said, the last people to follow women, follow Dajjal, will be women. And a man would have to return to his home and tie down, meaning coercively restrain his wife, his sister, his daughter, to protect them from being seduced and brainwashed by Dajjal. And the world of women today is being constantly increasing, the brainwashing is constantly increasing. And so for, to find a righteous woman today who submits to truth in the Quran, mashallah for her, mashallah for her, mashallah for her. This will make you a good wife. Allah says, for example, he says, if you have dispute between husband and wife, if there is a divorce, for example, he says, get hakaman min ahlihi wa hakaman min ahliha. Someone from his family and someone from her family to sit down together to try to mediate because you don't want this private matters to be brought into the public. Look at the beauty and the sense and wisdom. Hakaman min ahlihi wa hakaman min ahliha. Someone from his family and someone from her family will sit down and listen to both sides. Guess what's happening today? <laughs> from the time a divorce is to take place or threaten, everything is put out into the public to try to destroy the other party. If this is not sinful, go back to school. This is a violation of Allah's command in the Quran. This is sinfulness. And then the matter goes to court <laughs> and he cannot see his own children. Sometimes one year, sometimes two years. She takes those children and holds them as hostages against him. Hmm? This is part and parcel of the tremendous work of the shayateen on our sisters today. So may Allah bless the righteous woman of Islam who will not follow and fall victims of the shayateen. They're everywhere today, as I told you, most of all in Washington. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sheikh. Uh, next question. So I actually had a question, Sheikh. Yeah. So we are told um, that the Jal will have one eye and they will have calf written on his forehead. So I think for a lot of people here, that's probably what they have been taught. So could we know if that's meant to be interpreted or if it's as it is? I spent the whole month of Ramadan producing a video for every day of Ramadan. I don't know if Portsmouth was aware of that. No? Nobody. <laughs> Every day of Ramadan, I produce a small video, sometimes 10, sometimes 15 minutes long. And in these videos, I taught this subject about the Dajjal. That uh, our prophet said, every prophet has warned his people about the Dajjal. And the Prophet knew, Noah warned his people about the Dajjal. But I am going to tell you something no one has ever said before me. That the Dajjal sees with one eye, his left eye. He's blind in the right eye. It looks like a bulging grip. But your Lord is not one eye. Between his eyes on his forehead is written the word kafir, disbeliever. 
And every mu'min, someone who has faith in his heart, would be able to read the word kafir on his forehead, whether that mu'min or that believer is katib or khayru katib, literate or illiterate. You can still read. So, Ali radiallahu ta'ala, and who could read? And he could read kafir on his heart. But why is it that Abu Jahal cannot read? So we send Abu Jahal to the eye specialist. He's called the ophthalmologist for an inspection of his eyes. And the report comes back, his eyesight is perfect. But this is it strange. If Abu Jahal's eyesight is perfect, why can't he read? But Ali can read. Is it that Ali is not reading with these eyes? Do we have do we have any other eye beside these eyes? This is a branch of knowledge called epistemology. So we're not talking about external sight. We're talking about, yes, we have an internal eye. And we can see with internal sight. And so the reason why Ali could read is because he's reading not only with his external eyes but also with his internal sight. And the reason why Abu Jahal cannot read is because he is internally blind. This is our interpretation of the Hadith. And so Dajjal has external vision, the one with which you can pursue the scientific and technological revolution and scale the skies. But Dajjal is internally blind. And all those who are embraced by Dajjal will be also internally blind. And any time he plays a tune, they will dance to his tune. Would you like to hear what was the last tune? Shall I tell you? You want to know? The last tune? <laughs> the last tune <laughs> that the Jal played. And so many danced to his tune. Is our prophet said, when you stand up for Salah, do not leave any space between you. Because if you leave any space, shaitan will come and fill that space. So you must pray shoulder to shoulder. And the judge said, no, you must stand three feet apart. And if you stand three feet apart, I don't know how many shayatim could stand in between and fill that space. It is because they were internally blind that in this country, Britain, there were so many who danced with Dajjal and stood up for Salat three feet apart. They looked like monkeys to me. But Allah also said, <coughs> follow the Prophet. And our Prophet gave us what are the rules for Salat. And he said, don't change this, don't make bidah. Don't make bidah. If you make bidah and you change the religion, no water for you on Judgment Day from Kausar. And guess what they did? If you want to perform Salat, you must have a face mask. No mask, no entry. Is this a part of what the religion the Prophet Muhammad gave us? No. 
if someone wants to wear a face mask, that's up to him. He want, he's a man and he wants to be in niqab, fine. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you cannot make it obligatory. If you make it obligatory, you're changing the religion. Allah is al-Akbar in his house, not the government. Allah is al-Akbar in his house, not the government. I have never, ever performed Salat with a face mask. I have never participated in Salat with people standing three feet apart, except once in France I was caught by surprise and I was already in the masjid. Other than that, I never performed Salat because it's a bogus Salat. It's a bogus Salat. And so, when Dajjal stands up in Jerusalem and he declares, I am the Messiah, you and I would easily recognize this is Dajjal. But guess what? The sheep and the cattle who do not have internal sight, they will say, no, 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 he cannot be Dajjal. Why? Because he's seeing with two eyes. And our prophet said that Dajjal sees with only one eye. So he can't be Dajjal. The sheep and the cattle will not be able to understand this hadith and interpret it correctly. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Uh, next question, anyone? Yep, yeah, go to the front here. Uh, I was just thinking, it's a random point. Um, we know that he pleads if you are sworn in, that he's in the house. And I was just thinking, when the judge comes, how is the relationship with the judge? Is that team up? Who's the boss? Who's the boss? Who's the boss? So the question is, um, so when the judge does come back, Will Dajjal and Iblis work as a team or like he wants to know who, who was the boss? the boss? Who was the boss? Is like, is it? Dajjal has control over the shayateen. They are ordered to work for him. Shaitan is the boss of the shayateen. So he is in control, Dajjal, not Iblis. And Iblis and his shayateen will have to work for the job. Thank you very much, Sheikh. Mm. Next question. Mm. So the question is, um, so here in the West, people buy one house with riba and they say it's like acceptable because you need to live. So I uh, wanted to know whether there was any like evidence from the Quran or Sunnah that's allowed or whether that's completely forbidden and what best solution we should do. You have to be very, very foolish to make halal what Allah made haram. You have to be reckless to make full, make halal what Allah made haram. Those who have given this bogus fatwa, <laughs> that because you come to the West and that's the only way you can get a house, those who have given this bogus fatwa, I pity them on judgment day. I pity them on Judgment Day. Because what Allah has made haram, you cannot make halal. Yes, there are abnormal situations where the law is suspended temporarily. Like there is no food and people are starving 
and the only food available is lahmul khinzir, pork. And Allah says in the Quran, you can eat the pork. But that is only a temporary state. Because while you are eating the pork, you'll eat the minimum. Okay? Number two, you would lick your fingers, <laughs> enjoying the pork. Number three, while you're eating the pork, you're constantly looking for food so you can stop eating the pork. How then do we explain? You use this to go and buy your big house. You fill your plate with pork. My gosh, look at how it's loaded. It's not a one-bedroom house, eh? Number two, you are licking your fingers, you're enjoying, you proud of the fact you have this house. you boasting to others. Number three, you sign an agreement for 30 years of pork. When you suppose to eat the pork for the minimum time possible until you can get food. So don't use this analogy to justify your monstrous betrayal. You didn't have the knowledge because your scholars failed you. They didn't teach you the subject. And you went in and you signed the agreement. And now you have a rope around your neck. Don't blame me for that. Blame yourself. What to do now? You do what countless of my students have done when they realized what sin they had entered into. They got rid of the house as soon as they could. Regardless of what the price they had to pay. And then they rented. I lived in, Uni I lived in the United States for 12 years. And for 12 years I was paying a rent. I never, ever thought about buying a house. You rent a place, and when you cannot afford to rent a place, you make hitra. You go somewhere else where you can afford to live. That is my answer to you. It is haram. And no one can make haram. You cannot make it halal. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Next question. So the question is, um, so you mentioned earlier about wearing a mask, being a bida, and then mentioning pork when you're in like a severe situation that it's okay to eat. So is it the link between the two? I never said that wearing a mask was bida. I said those who want to wear the mask will have the freedom to do so. I have no problem with that. I said when you impose it, as the law, you're not allowed to enter the house of Allah. You're not allowed to stand in the suf to join the salat unless you have a mask. That is bid'ah. Yep. 
So the question here is, Sheikh, um, what are the dangers of celebrating people's birthdays and where has this tradition come from and is it allowed in Islam? Let me share with you my disappointment. <laughs> Ready, Portsmouth. I came to you to teach you a subject no one else can teach you. I'm the only one who can teach you. This is so important a subject to understand what is happening in the world today. And now am I being asked to answer about birthdays? No, I'm not going to answer that question. I'm going to tell you I'm disappointed because I expected from Portsmouth that you will pay some attention to a tremendously important subject. And your questions will be directed towards this. Secondly, I have women attached to me who are so intelligent, who have such insight that I, I benefit from them. That's the women attached to me. And our sisters are just silent. Silent today. I'm disappointed, yes, very. So I'm not going to answer that question. Uh, next question. I think we had a question here. two questions. Ah, yes. Here. Oh, good. We now have a question <laughs> from our elder sister. Maybe this is a bit unrelated. But yeah. I want to know what you think of Putin. About, a bit off the, off our topic, but what do you think about Putin? The subject is connected with the job. Putin is connected with the subject of the job and connected with the subject of Akhiru Zaman. In this sense, that Allah speaks of a time in the Quran when the Jews will be the most hostile of all people to us Muslims. And Allah says, at that time, there will be a Christian people who will be closest in love and affection for the Muslims. Who are those Christians? The chief of staff of the Pakistan Armed Forces is blissfully ignorant of this. The president of Turkey is even more blissfully ignorant of this. We are led by people who have less than a passing acquaintance with the Quran. That's our pathetic state today. And you're not allowed to say this. <laughs> the Christian people who will be closest in love and affection for us Muslims in Akhiru Zaman would not be the Christians of the West, where a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate. No. It would be those Christians who belong to Eastern Orthodox Christianity. And already you are seeing them drawing closer to us. Because the Ottoman Empire waged war on Russia for so many centuries, there was tremendous hatred in Russia against Islam. The Russian people, the Russian Orthodox Church would not allow the Muslims to build masajid in Moscow, even though you're about two million Muslims in Moscow. And guess what Putin did? He overruled the Orthodox Christian Church in Moscow. <laughs> and he ordered the construction of the biggest masjid in the whole of Europe, in Moscow. I don't need to go further to provide you with evidence. These are the Christians that Allah is speaking of, who will be closest in love and affection for Muslims. And look at Ukraine. Look at Ukraine. Those who are fighting with the greatest courage and valor in Ukraine are Muslims. Chechen Muslims are fighting heroic, heroic struggle in, in Ukraine. And all of Russia is seeing how the Muslims are fighting 
in support of Russia, in Ukraine. So the critics can bite their fingers in frustration. It makes no difference. The reality on the ground is an alliance between Mus Muslims and Orthodox Christians is on the way. And I left my home in Trinidad, left my wife in Trinidad, who is longing for me to be there, and travel to Britain. And I'm now going from Britain to Netherlands. More than five weeks of lecturing here and then two weeks of lecturing there. So I'll be a tired man when I reach to Armenia. Why am I going to Armenia? I'm going to Armenia because Azerbaijan is seeking to fan the flames of war between Muslims and Orthodox Christians. Not the Azerbaijani people, but the Zionist rulers of, Afghani of Azerbaijan. So I'm going to Armenia to tell them what the Quran says about Christians. This is my first visit to Armenia. And wherever I have gone in the Orthodox Christian world and I have presented the Quran to them, they have always responded positively. Several of them have now said, we accept the Quran to be the word of the one God. Read my book, which is there at the back, my last book. The Messiah, the Quran, and Akhirul Zaman. This is my last book. And see the forward of that book, written by an Orthodox Christian scholar. He's a Christian. He says, I believe that the Quran is the word of God. I believe that Muhammad is the greatest of all the prophets of God, but he's still a Christian. And I don't stand up on a table with a danda in my take the shahada, take the shahada. I don't do that. That's not wisdom. <laughs> that man is my dear brother and friend. And so we're seeing, I'm from Armenia, I want to go to Russia, but I don't think I'll get a visa. But I'm also going to, to Greece, I'm going to Macedonia. Why am I traveling to all these places in my old age? I'm trying to build fraternity between these two ummas, the ummah of Muhammad and the Ummah of Nabi Isa Islam. And Alhamdulillah, I thank Allah, He is blessing my effort with success. This is my answer about Putin. Jazakallah Khair Sheikh. I think we had a question here as well. Uh, so the question, first of all, was about a comment about riba, and then the second part was the main question about, was it making hijra and living with Orthodox Christians? Yeah. Uh, what would your advice be to people who are thinking about hijra and living with mm. Orthodox Christians? Muslims in this age should be following the advice of the Prophet who said, the time will come when the best property of a believer would be sheep and goats that he takes with him to the mountain sides. Pakistan has lovely mountains. Albania has lovely mountains. Take with him to the mountain sides and to places where rain falls, fleeing with his religion. When you go to the mountain sides, when you make Hitra, you should also try to bring with you and build with you fraternity with other people who live the religious way of life. 
you find a Hindu. And that Hindu is righteous, a righteous person. You can live with him as a neighbor. A Christian, a Jew, whoever is righteous and is not hostile to your faith. It is better than only Muslims living by themselves because then you are an easier target. Jazakallah khair, Chef. Next question, anyone? Have a question on the back here? So, the question is Is the virus a part of the Minsa? I came to the conclusion two years ago that this virus has not come from nature. Rather, that this virus represents biological warfare. Biological warfare. And I recognize the footprints of Dajjal. And the footprints of the Dajjal, I, I don't have the time to expand on this now, always comes in three parts. I don't have the time to explain. Uh, but uh, this book, uh, Jerusalem in the Quran, will give you the three parts. So we have had one part of the virus so far. And there's a second to come, and then there's a third. This is my eschatological view. This one was a light shower of rain. <laughs> but when the second one comes, it will be heavy rain. And when the third one comes, it will be thunder showers. So their plan is biological warfare that will wipe out large numbers of people. But our Prophet, Allah's blessing be upon him, prophesied. He said the Arabs will be attacked by plague. And they will die the way sheep die in a plague. So I, reading between the lines that this biological warfare is meant to culminate with the Arabs being wiped out in Israel and around Israel. I don't know when the second stage will start, but I was able to travel from Trinidad to London and know virus restriction. None. All they asked for was my passport. So it seems to me as though phase one is coming to an end. And there's a lull before phase two starts. I was happy when confirmation came in the Security Council of the United Nations. When Russia presented in the United Nations Security Council evidence that the Western world were funding laboratories in Ukraine where birds and bats were being infected with the virus and there were, they were, they were numbers attached to their legs and these metallic numbers could be activated from a satellite above. And they would study the migratory pattern of the birds, where they will fly. And when a bird was over a target territory, that bird would then be brought down through a satellite. And then the virus is spread in that territory. Russia presented the evidence in the Security Council of the United Nations. Evidence which confirmed and this was biological warfare. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. And the next question. Question you. Okay. Yeah, so, question is, if Muslims were to migrate from the West, which countries would you recommend? Go back to the land from where your parents came. And if you are 
from British ancestors. Then remember that Muhammad was from Makkah and he left Makkah. So if you have to leave Britain, you will be following the Sunnah. If you are from Pakistan, go back to Pakistan. I would love to go back and live in Pakistan myself. But I don't think the Pakistan armed forces will allow me to do that. Because I'm hitting them very hard now. Okay? The normal Pakistani can't do it. It will be too dangerous for him. But I can do it and I'll continue to do it. So I probably won't be allowed to enter Pakistan. But if you can return to Pakistan, many of my students in Britain have already done that. And they're building, they are building communities now in the mountains of Pakistan. Many of my students. And the mountains of Pakistan are so beautiful, you can't believe it. Why would you leave that to come and live here? Hmm? Azad Kashmir is so beautiful, the greenery. If you are from Egypt, go back to Egypt. If you're from Algeria, go back to Algeria. And if you are from Bangladesh, go back to Bangladesh. I, I went twice to Bangladesh. I went only to the south, not to the north. I went down to Teknaf. The only thing you have to be scared about in Bangladesh is the way they drive on the roads. <laughs> The way they drive on the road, yeah. I had a vehicle and we were driving to Chittagong and he knocked down a bicycle and he never stopped. He never stopped. <laughs> but the Bangladesh, the people of Bangladesh were so kind, so loving, so hospitable. It was a joy to be with them. So why don't you go back to Bangladesh? Yeah, what, I ask, what I ask you to do is I have a little book at the back. The Quran, the Great War and the West. Read that book and see what the Quran is saying of the fate which awaits the Western world, including Britain. And if your choice is to continue to live in Britain, or in Netherlands, or in Belgium. That's your choice. But I am saying to you that this is a ship that is sinking. And no one can prevent it from sinking. And when this ship sinks, it will take all on board and perish, they all perish. Allah gave you a mind with which to think. If you on board a ship which is sinking and you cannot prevent it from sinking, that is the fate which awaits this civilization which is sunk in sin. If you remain on board that ship, you are very foolish. You have not used your capacity to think. But if you get off the ship, of course, Dajjal will make it as difficult as he can to make, get off the ship. But if you get off the ship, you have a chance at least to get your wife to come off, 
to get your children to come out. Your father and mother. At this time they're saying, son, we are staying here. You don't, you're not going to get us to leave. We are comfortable. Your wife is saying, you can go, I'm staying here. Your children are saying, Papa, you can go, we're staying here. So if you get off the ship, at least you have a chance of saving them. Once you remain on board the ship, everybody will perish. So where is the boat not, not sinking, Sheikh, uh, which is not Bangladesh? <laughs> the jar comes with a river and a fire. But his river is a fire. And his fire is the cool waters of a river. So where on the face of the earth you see the green pastures. The green pastures are where you have the hard currency. <laughs> the US dollar, the sterling pound, the euro. These are the green pastures. Because over here life is affluent. You're able to live in some prosperity. This is Dajjal's river. But this is in fact a fire. And over there where life is miserable, you can't even get a job. The money is worthless. People are suffering. And that looks like the fire. But that's the river. So I would go without thinking. I will not even close my I'd go close my eyes and I'll live in Indonesia. Because yes, Indonesia is miserably poor. People are suffering. And yet I have never seen sweeter smiles, both from men and women. And uh, you know, there's a difference of a world between a natural smile and the smile of a politician. You know that. <laughs> the sweetest smiles I have ever seen in my life, both men and women, are in Indonesia, the poorest people. That's the purity of the heart. You look at the smile, and you know the heart. So too in Pakistan. In the villages, in the mountain sides, that's where you go when you want to make it draw. Don't move from here to Qatar. We've got a question here first. Okay, so the question is about, I think you, it was Sheikh's school in Pakistan. And yeah, so you have a school in Pakistan. How does it run forward when you're not there? And say if someone was to make hijrah to like Pakistan, how then, or anywhere, how would they best further their children's Islamic knowledge if they were living in a mountain or in a remote location? In terms of how do we keep going forward with eschatology? Yeah. So how do we keep eschatology going forward for future generations? Okay. I studied in Pakistan at Karachi University. I did philosophy. I also studied at the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies in Karachi. But that institute dazzled the world while my teacher was alive. Once he died, there was no one to replace him. So the Institute, since his death, is no longer producing the kind of scholars that my teacher wanted. I have never attempted to establish 
an institute other than an effort I made in Malaysia, but then religious affairs in Malaysia are not in the hands of the federal government, the hands of the, the monarchy, the king. And the king controls the ulama and so on. And they didn't like my profile of scholarship, the, Mo, the, Mo, the Maulanas of Malaysia. And so they controlled the police and we were being harassed. So that property is now closed down and we're trying to get it sold. I'm trying to transfer it now to Pakistan. But in Pakistan, we started only the online Institute of Islamic Eschatology. When we have the funds available, then we'll be able to build a structure and continue with an Institute of Islamic Study. How do you arrange your education when you make hijra? I can't answer all of these questions. All I can say to you is don't stay on board this sinking ship. That's all. Make hijra. And Allah says in the Quran, his earth is wide. Put your trust in Allah. And Allah can help you. And your children can get an education. And uh, that reminds me, if you've not taught your children to recite the Quran every day, what kind of education are you giving them? What kind of education are you giving your children? You have not taught your children to recite the Quran every day. You have not taught them to recite the whole Quran from cover to cover, to khatam the Quran every month. And you, you believe you are a successful parent? Your children have now grown up. They're teenagers, they're in their twenties and so on, and they cannot recite the Quran and you believe you have succeeded in teaching them and you're living here in Britain, what have you done? What nonsense is this? Don't you have any sense? Your first duty to your children for their education is to learn to recite the Quran and to recite the correct Jews of the Quran every day. My book, The Quran and the Moon, which explained this subject, last night it was sold out. So I don't have any copies now. But what you can do is give your name and give your contact number if you want to get a copy or a few copies of that book. Because we don't have it now. But we have stocks in Birmingham. So we will then send it to you, inshallah, okay? Yep. question is if the if the malhama comes and we haven't made hijra and we're all stuck here and we get nuclear bombed would we all be classed as shuhada i cannot tell but one thing you must banish from your heart is the fear of death let me repeat that if you are a Muslim, you must banish from your heart the fear of death. So if the malhama is to take place, nuclear war is to take place tomorrow, but you have work to do. You have to teach the Quran to people. You have to travel. Go on, keep on doing the work. Even though tomorrow this nuclear war will take place. But if you have a family, then the sensible thing to do is to get them out of the Western world because this West will be destroyed. And if you cannot leave the West, then at least leave the cities and remote, relocate to the remote countryside. I'm saying this to people and I'm not doing it myself. So I got a plot of land 
a hundred yards from the beach in Trinidad, remotely located, and the last few months I've been struggling to build a small home. Because over there we get fish. You buy the sea, you get fish. The remote countryside, there are lots of vegetables. So we can survive in the remote countryside. I'm doing that myself. Question it. So a question is, when Dajjal does appear, how can we prepare ourselves uh, for that moment? Is that, that's the question. The, <coughs> sorry. the Prophet, Allah's blessing be upon him, said, he gave us a timeline of events which will culminate with the appearance of Dajjal in person. He's already here, but you can't see him but he now appear in person. Those who have been learning from me already know this subject very well. But maybe some in Portsmouth have not been listening to me. This is the Hadith. Our Prophet, which Allah's, Allah's blessing be upon him, prophesied as only a Prophet could have prophesied. So if you're listening to me in Greece, if you're listening to me in Armenia, Listen, only a prophet could have prophesied like this. He said that when Jerusalem is built up, center stage in the world, at that time, Yatrib, meaning Medina, would be in ruins, meaning in forlorn desolation. And then he went on to say that when Yatrib is in ruins or in forlorn desolation, the opposite of Jerusalem, then the next event that will occur is the Great War, the Malhama. Then he went on to say that the next event after the Malhama, which could be either seven months or seven years after the Malhama, would be the conquest of Constantinople. This is why they changed the name to Istanbul to hide this hadith. And then he said, and of course I understood from my eschatology, that the conquest of Constantinople by a Muslim army was not only to free the Bosphorus for ships to pass through, from the Black Sea into the Mediterranean Sea, and NATO cannot stop that. But also, that the conquest of Constantinople was meant to allow us to return Hagia Sophia. Return Hagia Sophia to those to whom it rightfully belongs. And the Turkish government could take that and put it in a, in a pipe and smoke it. We are going to return Hagia Sophia, the cathedral, to those to whom it rightfully belongs, and you cannot stop it. When that happens, the alliance between Muslims and Orthodox Christians would be sealed, and you cannot prevent it. You cannot prevent it. He said, after the conquest of Constantinople, the next event, is the appearance of Dajjal. He will appear now in person. When Dajjal appears in person and he is ruling the world from Jerusalem, only then will Allah send the Messiah, sorry, the Imam, Imam al-Mahdi. And the Imam will then liberate Jazeera to Arab, so goodbye Saudi Arabia. And uh, <coughs> Darul Islam, the Khilafah state, would be restored in Arabia. That is the greatest threat to Israel now. The greatest threat of all. 
is the Khilafah state established in Arabia. And when the Imam leaves Arabia and goes to Damascus, it is then that Israel will launch a massive invasion of Syria to try to capture the Imam and kill him. And they will surround the masjid in Damascus. And that's when Nabi Isa Islam would return. But you must read my book, the last one I've written, the Messiah, the Quran, and the Akhir Zaman, it has this subject there. Okay? Shukallah Khair Sheikh. Next question. Go to the back. Uh, question is, who would you say are the real Muslim beings of our time? Who are the real Muslims of our time? Leader. Leader. Who are the real Muslims leaders of our time? Now. Yeah. Now. If you want to find a true Muslim and a true Muslim leader today, look to see who are those who are most faithful to the Quran. That's my answer. Shukallah khair, Sheikh. Next question. One here. Population, yeah. So at the time of Imam al-Mahdi, will the Muslim Ummah be smaller in like population mm. size? Okay, Potsmat, I think it's enough now. <laughs> it's been almost two hours, Potsmat, but I'm happy to see this appetite that you have in Potsmat. It's my first visit. I hope it won't be the last, because Allah will open a way for me to come back another time to Potsmat. But I'm happy, I'm happy with today's session. Uh, what's the question? Uh, at the time of Imam al-Mahdi, will the Muslim Ummah population still be <laughs> The Malhama is being waged. And uh, Israel and the Zionist world, they want it. American armed forces don't want it. The British armed forces don't want it. They, they prefer fight against Libya, but not Russia, not China. Because they know that there's going to be massive debt and our prophet has prophesied it. He said they're going to fight for the mountain of gold, which is going to come up in one of my lectures coming up on money. And 99 out of every 100 who fight would be killed. It is... Uh, Sad, I, I have sadness in my heart that mind is the only voice in the world of Islam today. Pleading, a voice in the wilderness, explaining these ahadith and applying them to the world today. I'm still the only one. I can't get them to come and join with me. But he said that 99 out of every 100 who fight for that mountain of gold will be killed. I can't explain the mountain of gold to you. It's the petrodollar monetary system, but I can't explain it. So when <laughs> the Malhama takes place, the world will become smaller. How much smaller? I don't know. Jazakallah okay. khair, so I think we can wrap it up for the question and answer. So I'd like to thank everyone for turning up and asking questions and being very attentive during the lecture. And I pray that everyone has learned some uh, new knowledge, in, inshallah. And now we will, inshallah, have our book sale. So Sheikh has, has his, I think, 31 books at the back. So if anyone would like to purchase a book, you can go ahead and buy the books. Don't forget the Quran in the moon, eh? It's a small book, just write your name. And we'll get a copy for you. Okay. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.